Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative Webinar Series. I'm Lisa Stromquist, the National Coordinator for Quality and Patient Safety here at CAFC. And our co-chair, Tracy Wrong, sends her regrets today, but we do have Darlene Bolivar, um, our other co-chair from the IWK, with us here. And I just wanted to uh, provide a quick note about CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative. So we meet uh, on the fourth Friday of the month, and we share ideas, projects, and initiatives from across the country in this format of webinars. So we welcome any suggestions for future sessions and hope that we can showcase some of your patient safety success stories and initiatives that you have going on in your areas. Uh, this knowledge exchange is a very important part of the work we do here at CAFC, so we appreciate all of your input and all of your ideas. And as well as these Friday sessions, CAFC also facilitates um, the CAFC Presents uh, series uh, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So just keep an eye out in your inbox for these announcements and uh, the registration information. So today I'm very excited to introduce uh, the topic and our speaker, Dr. Chris O'Connor. Uh, Chris is a critical care physician at Trillium Health Partners, and he's the founder and CEO of PatientOrderSets.com. And Chris brings his pragmatic uh, perspective and approach to healthcare innovations, and he focuses on the things that uh, are really important uh, to clinicians, uh, quality care and saving time. So today's presentation, Ready, Order, Set, Go, is going to focus on how we can improve patient safety, efficiency, and control costs through the use of checklists and uh, order sets. So I would like to pass the uh, podium over to uh, Dr. Chris O'Connor. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I really appreciate it, and I also understand and appreciate how busy everybody is uh, taking time out from their day for this presentation. Um, what I'm going to do uh, in terms of this presentation, I'm going to start with a 20, 25-minute uh, slide deck presentation, a bit about uh, patient order sets, a bit about how I got involved in order sets, how order sets can improve quality and safety and some different approaches to doing order sets, you know, building them on your own, working collaboratively. Uh, but then I'm going to have a lot of time left over at the end to ask questions, and I think that will uh, hopefully be the most informative and productive part of this, uh, to have a discussion around uh, some of the issues around order sets, uh, their value and implementation. So just briefly about myself in terms of how I got involved in this. I am a practicing critical care physician. I do practice at Trillium Health Partners, which is the old Mississauga General Hospital uh, in Mississauga. Um, it's the 32-bed medical surgical ICU where, where I practice. Um, I uh, graduated from medical school back in 1989, so I actually graduated uh, in the pre-evidence-based medicine era. And I was a family physician for three years, so I got to see the outpatient ambulatory primary care side of things. And then I went back and did another six years of training in internal medicine and critical care, and I've been practicing at Trillium Health Center uh, since the year 2000. And it was my, my hope with all of this training that I would emerge from my training needing to know everything I needed to know. And I think as everybody who knows on this call, that, that's simply not the case. And, and I, by 2001, I had a real sort of concern that, you know, orders drive the care of a lot of critical aspects of patient care delivery, all the medications, IV fluids, diet activity, vitals, drugs, and I had to write them down by hand from scratch every single time. And I was very worried that I would forget something, and it was just a huge amount of work. So I started working on order sets in 2001 at Trillium, built up an order set project there, and had a fair bit of success with it. But it was a huge amount of work, and it frustrated me enormously that I was working completely by myself, that I wasn't learning from other people, and it made no sense for in our publicly funded healthcare system for everybody to work by themselves. So I founded Patient Order Sets in 2006 with a, really with a collaborative vision of connecting the different professions, connecting the different key stakeholders in the system, such as professional societies and organizations like CAPC, uh, connecting clinicians and healthcare organizations. And since the initial start of this, it's been really gratifying to see that this collaborative approach actually does work, uh, that there is real benefit in it, and we're now up over 300 healthcare organizations across the country, from Vancouver Island in the west all the way out to Newfoundland in the east and Nunavut in the north. And we really have organizations joining at all scales of the system. So we have entire provinces, such as Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island. 
we have all kinds of regions or LINs or local health integration networks that join. And then we have also individual hospitals. And the hospitals range from the tiny, we have 10 bed rural hospitals that join, to major academic medical centers such as Hamilton Health Sciences, which has well over 1,000 beds uh, joining the network. So it's been really exciting to see all these different uh, healthcare organizations come and join. And even more exciting, it's been great to see all these expert groups and expert societies such organizations such as the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. Uh, we recently partnered with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. Uh, they do a lot of excellent work in terms of guidelines and creating all of this knowledge. Uh, we've partnered with CAPC as well too, which we're excited about. And we're really, I think, you know, we really see a huge opportunity in this space with all this knowledge that's being created with these, with these organizations. Uh, to work effectively with them to try to get the knowledge out to the point of care. And so what sits at sort of the foundation of this is the underlying complexity of medical knowledge. And I'll go over this pretty quickly because I think we all appreciate that there's so many different sources of information these days in terms of our formal education, but practice guidelines and all the web-based resources out there and the conferences we go to and speaking to our peers. It really is a huge amount of knowledge. And here's a slide, you know, the growth of medical journals and all the, the, the publications that go on. It truly is a vast amount of information. And one of our core challenges is that we start our formal education towards the left-hand side of the screen, but we practice out towards the right side of the screen. And over time, the amount of knowledge is growing exponentially. And it's inevitable that best practice, and I can say this as a clinician, is going to outpace our, user, our individual practitioner's knowledge. Uh, nozzles is simply growing too quickly and is too diverse for individual practitioners to stay on top of it. So this training paradigm where we have occasional responsive and partial training, when knowledge itself is continuous dynamic and continuously evolving, that we have a bit of a mismatch there. And the key thing in terms of driving a lot of this knowledge to patients is orders in the hospital setting and in the outpatient setting, there's equivalent processes. In having the individual practitioner have to remember all the treatments, everything that the patient needs from memory, and then write it down or type it in, if it's a computer system, from memory by scratch each individual time is an enormous challenge, an enormous burden, <coughs> and I think is one of the root causes of some of the challenges we see. At a bit more of a conceptual issue, I think one of the challenges that we have is we have a bit of a unidirectional flow of knowledge. We create this knowledge at the top, with the expert groups, medical associations, the literature, it filters down through the system, down to the frontline clinician. But we lack, I think, in some ways, an effective feedback mechanism uh, to filter a lot of this stuff back up and create, to create a more truly collaborative and truly integrated system where you have information flow throughout the system. And we're all familiar with, you know, how does the current system work? We know that the central challenges are quality, time, and cost. And I think we're all too aware that we all face challenges in all of these areas. And we know also the issues in terms of patient safety. I think everybody's deeply familiar with uh, preventable uh, medical error uh, leading to significant amounts of morbidity and mortality. Uh, these figures are quoted a lot. I think it's interesting that people become, we all become a bit numb to them after a while. Uh, but I, I think they are still remaining quite uh, salient. So then the question comes, well, what can we do to change this? Uh, it's a complex problem. It's called multifaceted, it's multifaceted. And, I mean, obviously there's not going to be one solution that fix all, fixes all of this. The problem's too big, too diffuse, too many different aspects to it. But I think one thing that can play an important role in this is the integration of medical knowledge into the care delivery process via tools such as order sets and such as checklists. And the key thing about checklists or order sets is that they're integrated as part of the workflow of the clinician. And a big difference, and actually I haven't put it up here in terms of order sets and checklists, but order sets are actually part of your workflow and properly done save you time, while checklists are usually something that's done additionally to your workflow and can cost you time. So they can both improve quality, but their impact on workflow can be different. But the key thing is putting the right knowledge to do the right task as a clinician as an integrated part of the workflow. And when you do that, I think you start to change the central model where you take knowledge, 
put it into the practitioner's brain, and this is actually a picture of me, because it is a real problem, where you have to output it, where you can now change the knowledge directly into executable knowledge, as I like to call it, that sits in line with the clinician's workflow. And we know making this transition uh, is highly effective in other industries, and we all, you know, all are all very familiar with checklists uh, in aviation, and aviation is extremely safe. What's interesting about the term checklist in aviation is that they're not really checklists in the sense you think of checklists. They're much more prescriptive. They're more similar to order sets. They actually tell the pilots what to do in different systems and lay it out as a series of prescriptive sets. So it's more like order sets, and we know it works there. We're also developing data from within healthcare uh, about the beneficial effect of order sets. The medical literature in this area, I think, you know, is reasonably characterized as relatively early. But that being said, the, st the, the studies are, are all overwhelmingly positive and show huge treatment effects. Um, we have data from within patient order sets, for example, about using uh, evidence-based checklists for the admission, and this is on the adult side uh, of uh, things, we're using order sets for the admission of common bread and butter adult problems like COPD, CHF, stroke. And what we found was the use of an admission order set reduced the length of stay for those patients from 5.9 to 4.7 days. So a, a very dramatic, very significant effect. And what was neat about this um, was that this effect, as we followed it through the study period, actually increased over, over time. So if order sets make sense for the care of patients, and I think they make both intuitive sense. I mean, I like to talk about like the Tim Hortons lineup effect, but if you went down to the lineup at Tim Hortons and said, you know, what do you think is going to be safer to take care of the patient? Would you prefer I scribbled it all down by hand, by memory, or typed it in and hope to a computer and hope I remember it all? Or should I use an evidence-based checklist that, you know, drives the workflow? I think most people would say there's an intrinsic intuitive appeal to using order sets. And if now there is, you know, an increasing body of literature to support that they are effective, then it starts to raise the question, well, uh, what's the most effective way to develop, deploy, implement, and measure the use of order sets? And I think everybody on this call has some familiarity with order sets. Every hospital uses them that they are about. I, I think the question is changing a bit from are order sets of any value, but rather how to implement them uh, most effectively. So the traditional approach for order set development and implementation has been kind of a do-it-yourself approach. Every hospital works by itself, or largely by itself, building and developing all of the order set content they need and trying to keep it up to date, and then also building and deploying the software tools that they need, the project methodology that they need, and then the analytical tools that they uh, need uh, to measure the impact of order sets on practice and to kind of do it on their own. And that's certainly what I started off doing at Trillium Health Center. I was building everything on my own. So then the question is, well, what does this look like? How effective is this? And this is work that we did with CAFC. We were very fortunate to work with CAFC around this, uh, looking at the use of nitric oxide and, uh, and patterns of practice across the country. And this is just one slide from uh, the analysis. And what this was looking at was the order sets used to wean nitric oxide uh, in that organization. I think this is a fascinating slide for a number of different reasons. I don't know, personally, as an adult uh, critical care physician, the only thing I know about nitric oxide is that it's really expensive and it can cost you an absolute, a lot of money. But I don't know anything else about it in the pediatric population. But what jumps off the slide here is, first, these are all the major academic pediatric centers across the, the, the country. They have all the leading uh, pediatric uh, experts in this area working at their organizations. And as you can see, there's a variance in their protocols by a factor of 10. So at the low bound, some organizations have weaning protocols that wean, wean uh, the patient off uh, nitric oxide as quickly as four hours. At the other extreme, one organization weans them off uh, at 48 hours. But even if you get take away the outliers, and about half of these hospitals are outliers, so if you get rid of the four-hour people and the 24-hour and up people, so you take about half the hospitals off, even in the narrow cluster in the middle, the variance is 100%. The low bound is 7, and the upper bound is 14. So fascinating, I think. I mean, uh, what you can definitely know is that I mean, all of these people can't be right. 48 and 4 can't be the same. And for sure, 
these protocols are driving, or order sets are driving differences in practice. So it raises the question, which is the most effective protocol and what is, what is the best way to do about this? But I think it's clear to see that if everybody working in a sort of a siloed environment, that we're ending up with incredible variation uh, in the implementation of practice, and we don't have a platform for figuring out what the best approach is. The other interesting thing is a capacity issue. You know, can hospitals build all the order sets to address all of the needs of all the different patients and keep them up to date? And what this slide is, it was also related to nitric oxide, and it was looking at order sets to address complications commonly seen with nitric oxide use. And what you can immediately see at the first glance here is that no one hospital has been able to build all of the nitric oxide uh, complication order sets that are needed and that it's a real patchwork in terms of what hospitals have built. And depending where you are, the hospital may or may not have an order set for that uh, particular complication. And that, I think, also intuitively strikes, I mean, has to strike one as not being an ideal situation. Um, if these the order sets are worth doing, then ideally everybody should have an order set for every complication. That, that would seem to be sent. So I think it does speak to the capacity issue. And I think anybody who's worked on an order set project uh, will quickly tell you is that it's a lot. You go into it thinking it's going to be easy, because how hard can it be just writing down a few orders on a piece of paper? But once you start getting into the complexities of the project, you realize that it is a lot of work. I think most order set projects do struggle with uh, issues around uh, uh, capacity, uh, both developing, but then also equally important, uh, maintaining their uh, order sets. So in terms of patient order sets, our approach has been a bit different. The question, you know, our sort of thinking around this has been, can we use a collaborative approach and start to leverage knowledge across the network? And can we also start to show the different variations of different organizations? I don't think variation in and of itself is actually a problem. When we don't have the exact knowledge around what the best protocol is, I think organizations can reasonably take different approaches. Um, I, I think that's okay. Uh, you know, one of the challenges with the evidence-based literature, I'll just go back to this here, is that it frequently, it frequently starts with high-level recommendations, but it often lacks the specificity required for implementation. So, you know, to take an adult example, for stroke patients, you keep their blood pressure less than 180 systolic in the acute setting. That's the evidence-based literature. But it doesn't say which drug, which dose, how do you escalate the drug dose, do you use one drug, two drugs, what conditions and limitations do you put around on the drug. The actual nuts and bolts of what to do is not specified. So it's not unsurprising then that different organizations will take a different approach to implementation given the lack of the evidence-based literature doesn't tell you how to do it. And so I think that variation is reasonable. The question then is, Given that variation, can we start to measure it? And so this is one of the reasons why we see, one of the reasons why we see so much variation. There's other factors which come into play here as well, too. Issues like resource uh, utilization, uh, regulatory environment, quality and safety initiatives, the local resources of the individual hospital itself. There's all kinds of factors that can come into play. But ideally, we'll start to measure this and start to see um, where, what the most effective strategies are so that we can start to, to, to learn from each other. And so with some of this philosophy that uh, patient order sets has brought uh, to some of the organizations we've worked with, uh, for example, uh, the province of Saskatchewan uh, was looking at the entire province. They had 13 independent health regions. There was no standardization of any type of practice. Uh, there was wide variations of resource utilization. I think we've all seen those graphs of different operation rates and different orderings, orderings of uh, uh, medications, um, and from a provincial perspective, they're concerned both about quality, but they're also concerned about cost. So uh, Saskatchewan approached us, and uh, we've been working with them now for almost a year around implementing a standardized order set solution across the entire province. Uh, one of the strengths of our approach is that rather than just trying to bolt down a one-size-fits-all across the province, which is widely diverse, it ranges from you know, larger urban centers like Regina to sparsely uh, populated northern centers, is that we have uh, worked with each of the regions uh, developing a solution that works for each of the regional contexts, uh, setting a standardized framework, and then as we go forward, we can bring progressive levels of standardization 
while at the same time ensuring that we have local ownership and adaptation so you get the buy-in locally to ensure that people you know, feel it's their order set and that it's not being you know, sort of foisted down on them from above, which is absolutely critical for adoption. And it's also critical, I think, for people to feel that they're included in the process, which is really important. So in terms of what order sets themselves look like and what the actual nuts and bolts of an order set is, all kinds of things you can put into an order set. You can put in pre-selected orders with things you think should be done most of the time. They can be unselected if you want to, but most people don't. You can put in optional orders. You can put in free text order lines. So you've got that ability, and I think this is very important, to customize the content uh, for individual patients' needs. You can uh, integrate patient demographics and other information from other parts of the chart, so things like age, weight, allergies, you can integrate into the order sets. And you can provide, uh, you know, you can provide links out to other referential knowledge sources, or you could integrate, you know, alerts, warnings, and statements into the actual order set, order set itself. So it really is a platform for integrating all kinds of different uh, decision support capabilities uh, uh, to help the clinician, um, you know, order the right thing in the right way. And one of the things I'll just say quickly that I love about order sets a lot is that I think it gets the right balance between completely free text and all the challenges that we have there. And on the other bookend of things, all too often people try to perfectly script a solution that completely bounds it and, you know, has branching logic and it's all comprised of if, if them statements. The problems with that is it lacks the flexibility to accommodate all the variation we see in clinical practice. So I think the ideal tool, which I think order sets are well suited to do, is sit somewhere in the middle and then try to get that balance right between free text and uh, accommodating individual variation while at the same time providing a standardized framework that actually works with the clinician's decision making. I'll also speak just quickly about the impact on medical education. I think these are excellent education tools. There's an emerging and early literature showing that, and it is early, but it is showing the effect that order sets have a positive impact on learners, uh, that this is an educational resource for them, and uh, it does not impair their ability to learn, and actually quite the contrary, it actually helps them learn better. Another neat thing about order sets, when they're properly constructed, is that they're innately a data gathering tool. If you build them properly, you organize, you standardize at all levels of the order set content, from the word level down to individual order items, which are grouped into functional units called modules. You sequence the modules, you put them in a document, and then you relate documents to other documents. So in a sense, it immediately codes what the orders are doing, in which context, in which phase of care, and that's done automatically. And so this data, if properly built, can then map out to customized clinically intelligent dashboards so that you know what's actually going on in your organization. And further, you can have data, data analytics, which show overall utilization. You can show which clinicians are ordering the order sets. And you can map out to a whole number of different quality metrics. And you can track things like quality-based funding, adherence to accreditation standards, adherence to other quality initiatives. And if you're a case costing hospital, you also have the potential to link these order items. If you know what things cost, you can also link it to cost items as well, too. You can also track through your organization information flow and how uh, both uh, patients and uh, best practices migrate through your organization because order sets set up transitions of care, they set up best practices, and they set up the patient journey uh, through the hospital as well too. So it creates a foundation um, for building and measuring those, uh, those uh, aspects of the patient care journey as well too. So the final slide, just quickly, I think order sets are great. One of the very few things as a clinician that if properly done will both save you time and improve quality. And I think one of the challenges that all, clinical, all clinicians have is that you're constantly asked to do a better job. All too often, people tap you on the shoulder and say, I want you to do this quality initiative or that quality initiative. You know, and you know, to do that, you're going to have to do extra work. You're going to have to do extra documentation or these extra processes. And that's all well and good, but everybody's busy and nobody has time. And this extra work it certainly becomes burdensome. So the nice thing about order sets is that really the pitch to your clinicians is use this, save time, and at the same time, you will actually improve quality and safety and you'll provide all these secondary benefits in terms of data 
and cost re re reduction as well too. So that's a really nice uh, value proposition, I think. And it's always good, and I'll say this as a frontline physician uh, who uh, was just in the ICU last week, I think it's always nice to have tools that uh, both make your life easier and solve a myriad of sort of the practical problems that you encounter every day as you take care of your patients. So that's a quick overview of uh, sort of uh, both patient order sets and the role that order sets I think can have in quality and safety. And I think what we'll do now um, is just open it up to questions and uh, see what people have to say. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I just want to remind everybody, uh, just uh, type any of your questions or comments into the question box uh, in your control panel um, on the right-hand side. I don't know, Darlene, did you have any uh, any uh, thoughts on uh, any of this information that we just received? Um, I, I thank you both to, uh, to both of the panelists for bringing this information to us. And I had the opportunity, uh, Chris, to meet you and to view this many years ago. So it's wonderful to see how far it's progressed and to see the uptake in it. Um, I, I guess uh, I'll throw it over to the audience. But I guess one question I have is, um, given that we're primarily, well, we are all uh, a pediatric collaborative, and I know that the, the pediatric order sets ha have grown. Do you have any specific plans of, of how to grow subsets? Uh, we're most interested, obviously, in the uh, pediatric world to, to grow those subsets and make it uh, even more robust than it is for the pediatric uh, populations. Well, absolutely. So it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, first, on a couple of fronts, in terms of we have a reference library that we've built collaboratively with subject matter experts. We have an extensive pediatric library of content. Content. We have an extensive neonatal library of content that we've built up. I think in total it's close to 100 order sets that sort of cover most of the common things. And then from the collaborative perspective, um, we have a few academic centers such as Hamilton Health Sciences, but more broadly spaced, we have an enormous number of you know, large community hospitals that also have substantial pediatric pra practices as well, too. So we have, uh, in terms of the collaborative network, those organizations have posted their order sets to our collaborative network. And so for the first time, we can start to see some of the tools that are being used commonly to care for patients across Canada. So we have that collaborative uh, uh, piece as well, too. And I think going forward, I think pediatrics is an area that we have enormous enthusiasm for. And we see just continuing to build out our pediatric library, continuing to grow our network. You know, the partnership with CAPSI is, is enormously exciting. And I think we're just at the start of uh, building the library out, building better order sets, connecting them more effectively to the guidelines and the knowledge that have been built, and then critically trying to close that gap, saying, well, how are the guidelines being implemented in best practice, and what approaches do work, and can we start to use that to inform you know, how we do this and potentially uh, make it more effective over time. Excellent. That's, that's really exciting work that the, collab that the CAPC Collaborative um, could certainly benefit from, and I look forward to um, seeing more of it in the future. Lisa, are there any uh, questions from the audience? No, uh, everybody's pretty quiet today. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm just wondering if anybody in the audience, if, um, if you have um, experience in your own organizations, uh, do you have a, a team there or a, a group there that um, is able to focus time on developing uh, uh, order sets in-house, or do you work uh, collaboratively with you know, other, uh, other organizations in your area? I know that sometimes, um, say in Toronto, maybe Mount Sinai and um, um, sick kids will work on neonatal things together or something like that um, just because they work so closely. Um, those are the sorts of opportunities. Um, the opportunities we're talking about right now are, are, are sort of the larger collaborative opportunities that are not unlike what we do here at CAF-C. So uh, patient order sets in CAF-C um, uh, collaborated uh, a little bit on when we did a, when we developed our uh, opioid safety resource kit, um, patient order sets helped, uh, helped us out by uh, sharing uh, an order set that uh, supported our recommendations of um, of um, uh, the concentrations, the standard concentrations that we were that we were promoting, and helping to um, 
really operationalize uh, the, the guideline that, that we had developed. So, and we're looking forward to sort of working um, with our nitric oxide uh, uh, project in the same way. So we're working collaboratively across the country developing the guidelines and then we have to find a way to operationalize those guidelines just as uh, Chris was saying that um, you know through the development of the of um, the order sets and the checklists to be able to uh, take that to the next level be able to say we want you to do this and this is how you can do it so, so it's pretty exciting work that we're that we're uh, embarking on so I don't um, I still have no questions or comments and it's uh, not usually such a quiet crowd. So um, is, um, is anyone in the audience actually using order sets now that um, y you know they can either talk about um, how it's helped standardize, how it's helped you use their resources more wisely rather than um, everybody creating their own, or um, you know any future plans for um, how they are going to develop order sets and, and contribute to. I can, um, dating back to 2009, when we all experienced H1N1, I know that in a matter of days, really, um, the order sets for management of H1N1 was up and ready um, and included a pediatric component. So um, that was certainly a, a quick res and responsive way for the country to not uh, duplicate and replicate the wheel over and over again. So anybody out there that would like to contribute? So you can either, you could raise your hand if you have a question and I can unmute your line or you can please just uh, type anything in. One, one thing potentially while we're sort of waiting for people, we're sort of happy to take questions. If you want to give us the screen back, we can show you a bit what the analytics, so we can just give you a quick look at our analytics and give you just a, a flavor of some of the things that we can, uh, that you can do with a properly structured order set in terms of some of the analytics that are possible. Yeah, I think that's one of the most exciting parts of, of, um, of this um, platform uh, are the analytics. And so, for example, I think you're seeing our, our screen now. And So this is a neonatal admission order set that we have here. And you can hover over each individual box and see the ordering rate for that individual thing. And red is ordered a lot and yellow is sort of middle, and blue is less. And so it starts to give you that actual data out to the point of care around how that particular order set is used um, and sort of the frequency that things, that, that things uh, can be, that are uh, used. And I think this data, I think, is interesting to clinicians because, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, you generally don't have a sense of how order sets are impacting practice. And this really gives you that gives you that sense right at the point of care in real time. And so we're starting to drive this data out, and we're start, uh, starting to find a, a really good uptake in terms of how clinicians react to this heat map kind of data that you can provide at, at, at the point of care. So again, I'm just wondering if anybody um, anybody out there. Um, if they have order sets that are, you know, built into their systems already, or if it's, you know, all sort of paper-based, or if, um, you know, if it's linked to anything else, like this, um, like this um, um, set is shown, it's it's linked right into their entry point uh, uh, data collection, so it makes it um, you sort of killing two birds with one stone here, or many birds. So you're getting the work done more efficiently, but then you're also tracking what you're doing and able to use that data to improve practice. So I think it's it's. Uh, I yeah, and I guess I'd further like to say on the guideline, like we create excellent knowledge in terms of the guidelines, but how that you can then map the guideline to the specific order item, and then you can map the frequency with which the order item is being linked, and then you can link that knowledge, I think, back to guideline creation. Because then you can see for the first time how is the guideline knowledge being implemented and how it's directly improving practice. And again, I think that's going to be useful for further and more effective guideline creation. So the, the goal is really to provide better 
local engagement into the order set itself, but then I think potentially provide a pool of knowledge as this grows and develops over time um, to uh, provide that knowledge uh, for further guideline development. And I think that's a new capacity that I think will be that, that will be pretty exciting as the, as the body of knowledge here grows bigger. And um, can you uh, sort of customize these to uh, fit onto different platforms in different um, different organizations are going to have sort of a different um, system already in place? And how would you embed this sort of system into, is, is, it, is it something that you do or do, do people have to, uh, or organizations have to restructure everything that they're doing? That's a good as, question. And so it's a very good question, and it, you know what I can say is that over at over 300 hospitals across the country, uh, we've seen everything, and everything exists. And you can imagine this huge heterogeneity around where hospitals and healthcare organizations are on their IT develop roadmap. And we range from organizations that are purely paper-based, and we can work with them. We encounter a lot of organizations that are at a sort of an intermediate path. They've got some computerization. They've got some paper, and I'd say that's typical for Canada. And we can deploy things like entry point to complete the order sets online and do it that way. Or for organizations that have gone, gone to full CPOE, uh, we can have a discussion around that in terms of the analytics and around the content as well, too, and around the structuring of the order sets. So it really depends uh, sort of where you are in your journey. But from our perspective, it doesn't matter. We can work with organizations regardless of where they are. But certain principles stay the same regardless of the IT environment, whether it's paper or CPOE. You need evidence-based, up-to-date content. You need content that reflects key quality and safety initiatives. You know, with health system funding reform and quality-based procedures, you're going to need content that directly maps the quality-based funding uh, procedure list if you want to get paid, and that's a big deal. You need content that supports the ISMP and other regulatory things, and so you, the content's absolutely critical. And then you need to structure it in a way that supports your user's workflow, so it's intuitive and easy to use and supports how clinicians think. Uh, you need content that's modular and acts as a reminder. You need there's a structure that facilitates standardization, so building it in a modular way so you can maintain organizational standards when appropriate across your organization is absolutely critical. Then you need to deploy it at the point of care so that the clinician can find it when they need it, and then ideally you've structured it properly to only think up front, so then the analytical piece downstream becomes a lot easier, because then if you build it properly the first time, then you're going to have the analytical uh, engine you need on the back end the data to get that out. And so we uh, have conversations with different organizations around where they are on that journey, and we can work with organizations uh, around that. And this is just a heat map here of another order set. Um, uh, one of the things that we can do is we can drill down on any individual field and bring up the ordering practices of each individual physician at the point of care regarding that particular uh, best practice. And so this individual level of data, uh, I think, has enormous uh, potential uh, uh, to uh, help shape practice and help shape our understanding of what people actually do at the point of care. And you can see this is trillion. And what's been fascinating about the data is that the variation is gargantuan. Like some this calcium magnesium test on how the patients are admitted, and it ranges all the way from people order 100 percent of time down to people who don't order it rarely at all. And then the question is, you know, they're not all right, uh, likely, and so what is the best approach? And I don't know what the best approach is, but I'm sure that not everybody, that not all of these approaches are equivalent. And so at least this starts to give us this data. And then it really, sets the, it really starts, I think, in a very exciting way to start to close the gap around how these guidelines and what people do with them and how they actually apply them to individual patients. And I think it's an entirely new area of knowledge that's uh, starting to be developed. Great, it's it's very exciting. So, I have um, some questions from uh, the IWK. So, are there any participants who could share examples of chemotherapy order sets? And additionally, uh, how changes are made to those sets? So, I don't know if anybody out there, or if you have uh, experience yourself with uh, in your organizations, um, I could actually. Um, I can unmute 
uh, Marilyn et al. who are in uh, who are in IWA. Actually, Carolyn's question. Okay. Okay. Carolyn, do you want to get close to the mic? Sure. Yeah, I'm just I'm an improvement consultant. I support the uh, oncology service here, and we've worked tirelessly to look at the existing chemotherapy order sets. And right now, we're embarking on how to make changes in those sets. Uh, uh, trialing, we're trialing a change box for one change on an order set, but. If there are additional changes, we would have to start the order set new again. So it just it just creates a number of uh, like numerous pages in the pharmacy department when they get these change um, changes to orders. And we're we're just we have a, a committee that's looking at this. And I just thought you might have some examples of what other areas are using or just rewriting the whole set new or whatever whatever you can offer. So it's a good question, and it may make sense for us. Sorry, it's a bit of an echo now. Um, it, it may make sense for us to actually connect with you offline because there's a fair. We need to get a bit more information to fully understand what the what the what the issue is. Um, we do have a library of oncology chemo sets. Uh, the sets are all customized for each individual organization to meet your own workflow, uh, resource, and formulary needs. Just to state a few things. We usually work closely with organizations around their order set projects to deal with all these precisely, it's all these practical issues. And I got some of the documents in terms of your order set governance and life cycle and some of the key things in terms of your template and order set development toolkit and all the different parts and things you need to make your order set project go. So we actually work with organizations to address precisely the kinds of issues that you have. Um, to help address that. Um, and we found that to be pretty effective. And it's really not about a one-size-fits-all solution. It's, you know, every organization, it's the, the certain principles broadly apply across organizations, but they, need to, they do need to be adapted to individual organizations and the sort of having that conversation uh, that is uh, very uh, important um, around, around that. Once you've completed the order set, then the question is, you know, once you have the order set content and you have to complete it at the point of care, you can do that on pre-printed paper order sets, which you know can create issues. You can do it in full CPOE systems, which some of our organizations do. Or we have an application called Entry Point, which you can just launch from within your hospital information system, brings up the same patient, and then you can just bring up an order set as a fillable form, basically online, and uh, you can just complete and fill it out online. So that's uh, you know, an intuitive solution, and then it maps out to the data and can support a lot of the workflow aspects of organizations. And we're really neutral from the patient order set perspective on how organizations do, sort of where you're at. I mean, the most important thing, I think, is to get the content in an intelligent way out to the point of care. And you can see you can have things like radio buttons, and then you can just, you know, submit the order set um, here. Uh, 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 for uh, for the patient. So really, it, it depends a bit on your local circumstances, and we're happy to discuss that with you and give you some ideas, which which might help. And we'll just say, you know, an entry point, once you save an order set, um, it, because it's all data, just the selected orders are in regular font. The ones that aren't picked are lightly grayed out, so you can immediately see what's been picked and hasn't been picked. And pharmacy can find that to be a very important feature in terms of the safety of completing the order set. And that's something we found good. And then we can send the document electronically to pharmacy, and then you can change the document after it's been completed if you want to support that particular type of uh, workflow. So once again, it's just a, it's sort of uh, a very flexible approach that can be just used to meet your local local needs. So uh, Carolyn, I'd be happy to uh, connect uh, you and uh, Phil and Chris after the call if you want to discuss this further. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, you can actually connect with my email via Darlene Bolivar too. So perfect. Um, that's how we can connect. Perfect. Excellent. Thank Thanks you so much. I'm just wondering if there's anybody else online who has um, uh, those chemotherapy order sets, uh, if they've had some experience in their organization. So um, you can um, 
you're not certain about that now, but maybe um, you could connect with me after, and uh, if you have some of that, because again, the the whole um, the whole purpose of our collaborative is uh, is to be sharing knowledge, so and uh, helping each other uh, with all of the same issues that uh, that we deal with on on a day to day basis. So. Um, Right now, I have uh, no more questions um, uh, presently, and uh, I might take this time uh, to remind everybody that our next call is on the 28th of March at this time, and we're going to be talking about uh, um, interfacility critical care transport of maternal, neonatal, and pediatric patients, and some work that uh, has been going on around uh, developing uh, standards, uh, standards of practice. And again, that's a, a national collaborative has been working on that. And uh, a little bit of a reminder of uh, CAFC's um, uh, annual conference will be in Calgary this year. And uh, it's uh, climbing mountains and uh, resiliency, leadership and resilience uh, in, uh, in healthcare. So it uh, should be quite an interesting and exciting uh, event as ever and uh, hopefully uh, some of you can make it out there to Calgary to be with us and we will of course have our patient safety symposium on the Sunday and uh, more details about that will be uh, will be coming out so don't know Darlene if you have any final words uh, no just uh, to thank very much um, both Phil and uh, Chris for the wonderful presentation and we all will I will uh, suggest that the lack of uh, questions is because the presentation was so clear and self-explanatory and I'm sure that uh, you will you may get contacts from uh, people who uh, are more interested in exploring it at a local level with you so thank you very much for um, bringing the order sets to the CAFC collaborative and as Lisa said uh, the next collaborative call will be Friday March the 28th um, I think is yes, that correct, Lisa? that's correct. Okay, perfect. Uh, March the 28th, and um, I hope everybody uh, joins the call at that time as well. Thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend.